Bonjour encore. Good afternoon, everyone. Mon nom est Antonia Mayoni, je suis doyenne de la Faculté des Arts. My name is Antonia Mayoni, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, which houses the Max Bell School of Public Policy. Et c'est avec grand plaisir que je vous accueille cet après-midi à l'Université McGill, et surtout à cet événement très important organisé par l'École des politiques publiques Max Bell. Inauguré en 2017 et dirigé par mon collègue l'économiste Chris Reagan, l'école Max Bell se bâtit sur les fondements de l'université et de la faculté, vouée à la recherche et l'enseignement dans l'étude des politiques publiques et de former la relève québécoise, canadienne, internationale, des décideurs qui vont faire face aux enjeux du futur dans le monde. The Max Bell School of Public Policy was also founded on the aspiration to become a venue for exchange and dialogue on key policy questions that shape Canada's present and future and its leadership role in the world. So what better speaker then to address these lofty aspirations? We are so very happy to have with us today Carolyn Wilkins, the Bank of Canada's senior deputy governor. Appointed in 2014 to a seven-year term, Ms. Wilkins oversees the strategic planning and economic and financial research of the bank, sharing responsibility for the conduct of monetary policy with other members of the governing council and serving as a member of the bank's board of directors. Madame Wilkins est en poste à la banque depuis 2001, ayant auparavant occupé les, des fonctions au ministère des Finances et au bureau du conseil privé euh, au gouvernement du Canada. Elle est diplômée en économie de l'Université Wilfrid Laurier et détient une maîtrise de l'Université Western, tous les deux nos, uh, nos institutions sœurs en Ontario. Mesdames, Messieurs, please join me in welcoming Carolyn Wilkins to McGill University. Bonjour tout le monde, ça, ça me fait vraiment plaisir d'être ici parmi vous à Montréal avec la neige, mais on était à l'intérieur dans une belle salle avec, euh, avec les amis de Montréal. It's really a pleasure to be here today at the Max Bell School of Public Policy and I'd like to thank uh, Dean Maoni for the kind introduction and also Chris Reagan for, for the invitation. Now, many of you will already know that Max Bell was a shrewd business person, he was a media mogul, and he was all this at a time that Canada saw the, the Great Depression, the Second World War, and Canada, in fact, joined the world stage. Max Bell was also dedicated to public affairs and the greater good of Canadians, and so I just can't think of a better place to add to a conversation about the best monetary policy framework for Canada. The Bank of Canada, it's a little bit of memory lane here, but the Bank of Canada opened its doors in Max Bell's era in 1935 to support the economic and financial welfare of Canada. And what that has meant in practice has naturally changed quite a bit over time, and, and it's really just to keep up with the complex and evolving world. For the last quarter of a century, though, the bank's monetary policy framework has focused on targeting low and stable inflation in the context of a flexible exchange rate. Now, this is not just the bank's goal. It's shared with the federal government, both of us acting on behalf of the people of Canada. It's formalized in what we call the Inflation Control Agreement, and this agreement is renewed every five years and has been supported by six prime ministers of different partisan stripes. Now, we've already started working on the next renewal of the Inflation Control Agreement that's set for 2021, and we're doing that with our finance colleagues. So having a formal agreement with a democratically elected government supports the credibility of our shared objective. It gives the Bank of Canada the independence it needs to pursue that objective. The bank has used this independence wisely. We've delivered low and stable inflation, pretty darn close to our 2% target, on average over the last, say, nearly 25 years. 
We've managed to do this even in the face of big economic shocks, like the run-up in oil prices in the mid-2000s, then the plunge four years ago, and of course, the global financial crisis that was in between. Yet, even a well-functioning monetary policy framework deserves an open-minded discussion, particularly in the post-crisis world that we live in. Now, there are a couple of challenges facing our framework that mean that it may not serve the economic and financial welfare of Canada in the future as well as it has in the past. This is important. I'm going to say it again. It is really important because the objectives that we set and how we go about achieving them have real implications for people in their everyday lives. This couldn't be more obvious than it is today as interest rates rise to more normal levels. This is resulting in difficult adjustments in the finances of many. At the same time, the bank's actions are supporting a stable economic environment for even more households. Now, my remarks today are intended to spark a, a really good discussion. And I'm going to focus on two public policy questions that are shaking, shaping our work plan leading up to the 2021 renewal. The first question is, well, what alternative frameworks might do a better job than inflation targeting, if any? We know there are contenders, but we haven't conducted a full horse race since the 1980s. The second question is, well, whatever, regardless of whether we stick to the inflation targeting or we move to something new, what supporting policies can we bring to the table? We know that the Bank of Canada's policy toolkit, along with other public policies, are critical to reinforcing the shared objective. Now, our research work that we're doing is drilling down in these areas and will be informed by extensive engagement outside the bank. Our annual economic conference that we held this year, just a couple of weeks ago, was on this subject and it, it yielded what I would call a pretty lively but productive debate. And our research is being published as we go so that Canadians can follow our progress. Now let's remind ourselves what we were trying to achieve with our current monetary policy objective of 2% inflation. Now the most obvious answer is low, stable, and predictable inflation. In previous eras that some of us are old enough to remember, but others aren't, episodes of runaway inflation in this country and, and in others led to major recessions and years of stagnant growth. Yet pursuing this objective achieves much more than just price stability or a nominal anchor, as economists like to call it. It steadies the economy at the same time. And stabilizing purchasing power makes it easier to plan personal finances and business investments. It also helps uh, smooth the economic swings that result in job losses or financial stress for people. Well, despite these virtues, there are a couple of challenges linked to how we currently do business that have grown in importance since the crisis. And these were front and center at the discussions we had at our annual, annual conference a couple of weeks ago. So one challenge is that the central bank is more likely to run out of conventional firepower in the, in the event of an economic downturn. And what I mean by conventional firepower is the ability to lower the policy interest rate. And the reason for this is pretty straightforward. Our estimates of the nominal neutral rate of interest, where monetary policy is neither stimulative nor restrictive, is currently in the 25 to 3.5% range. And this is about two percentage points lower than in the early 2000s. Now, our policy rate can't be set much below zero, and so there's now a lot less room to lower interest rates in response to events that drag the economy down. Estimates for Canada show that the probability of the bank facing this challenge is now about 13% instead of about 3% when the neutral rate was higher. Now, there are unconventional policy tools that could be deployed in, situ in this situation if they're needed, although, as I'm going to explain later, we still have much to learn about their effectiveness. A second challenge is that a lower neutral rate may encourage households and, and investors to take on excessive risk. This leaves the economy exposed to boom-bust financial cycles. 
it's a pretty difficult problem to solve for monetary policy since monetary policy is really ill-suited for dealing with this. I'm going to speak a bit later about other tools that can be more effective. So my bottom line here is that although our inflation targeting framework has served us very well, we should look for ways to improve upon it. This leads me to my first question. What other, what other frameworks might do a better job? The Bank of Canada is not alone in this, this line of inquiry. inquiry. Many of you might have noticed the Federal Reserve System announced that they were also doing a review. Um, they announced that last week. And many influential economists have urged us and other central banks to consider alternatives. There are many of them out there, but the most popular ideas out there these days are one raising the inflation target or targeting a path for prices and nominal income or adding full employment to our objectives. Now the bank has considered many of these alternatives as part of past renewal processes. Remember I said that it's been around for over 25 years and we renew it every five. But we haven't actually conducted a thorough side-by-side -side review of the main options since the original agreement was struck in 1991. It's time that we do so. We need to be as clear as possible about the criteria that we're going to apply in our assessment. Now, my list of the most critical considerations in the post-crisis era are, first, the framework needs to focus only on objectives that monetary policy can actually achieve. In the long run, monetary policy can only affect prices. It's what economists refer to as the long-run uh, neutrality of money. And what this implies is that monetary policy ultimately cannot control or resolve underlying structural issues, such as the long-term competitiveness of an economy or the quality of jobs. It must therefore focus on shorter-term stabilization objectives that help reduce cyclical issues affecting the economy. In other words, objectives that smooth the business cycle. These objectives need to be clear and they need to be measurable so that the public can plan accordingly and the central bank can be held accountable. A case in point, the clarity and simplicity of our inflation targeting mandate that we have now has underpinned its success. The second thing is that the framework needs to support the well-being of Canadians, what I like to call the greater good. This, re this requires looking at more than how well a monetary po policy framework performs in terms of aggregate or macro outcomes, although aggregate or macro outcomes are still central to success. What we know is that different monetary policy frameworks can have different implications for other factors that also matter for welfare, like financial stability or the distribution of income and wealth. To be clear, I'm not saying that the goals of monetary policy should be to target these factors or that it's even easy to measure them. What I am suggesting is that we consider them as best we can in the design of the framework. And third, the framework should serve Canadians well in both good times and in bad. And this requires a set of bedrock objectives that apply in all circumstances. The framework needs effective and credible set of policy tools that are at the ready to achieve these objectives both in normal times and in extraordinary circumstances. It also ideally rests on a foundation where other policies that affect economic and financial stability complement the monetary policy objectives. So let me talk and turn to some of the main alternatives uh, to our framework and give you a little bit of a tour of what we know about them already and then, and then what are the outstanding questions. The way, the way I think of it is that some of the options are a bit like home renovations. It's just work that improves the existing framework. Others are more like buying a completely new house. Now those who are going to look at the written version of my remarks will be really happy because they're going to see more footnotes than usual. Uh, that's really just a testament to the depth of good work that's already been done in this area. So for over two decades, Canada's monetary policy framework has centered on an inflation target of 2% within a control band of 1% one, one to 3%, and I already mentioned you know, with a floating exchange rate. Now the control band is there because inflation fluctuates a lot in response to temporary factors like 
changes in gasoline prices and that don't necessarily warrant a monetary policy response. But it also allows the bank to be flexible in how aggressively we pursue the target. The bank chooses the pace of interest rate moves in a way that limits swings in aggregate income, while still achieving the target within a reasonable time frame. And we might also adjust the pace to limit the buildup in financial vulnerabilities. Now, some economists have suggested that we could address the issue of limited firepower by raising the level of the inflation target to, say, 3 or 4%. Um, what they're arguing is that a higher inflation target would restore some of the conventional policy room to maneuver by allowing a higher average nominal interest rate over time. I kind of look at this more as like a simple home renovation to make the, for, the, the framework more effective in bad times. Well, the bank researchers, they examined this option during the past renewal cycle that was completed in 2016. And, and what they found was that higher inflation would be felt by everyone, but most acutely by people living on fixed or lower incomes. Moreover, we were concerned that the bank's credibility would be undermined if people thought it was just a slippery slope to even higher inflation targets down the road. Well, that seemed like a pretty steep price to pay for some insurance against bad times. Instead, we thought that a credible set of unconventional policy tools could greatly reduce the need for this type of insurance. Now, a bigger in innovation to policy and the policy framework would be to set a target path for the level of aggregate prices rather than the inflation rate. I look at this as akin to buying a new house, but still in the same neighborhood. For example, the, the central bank could commit to keeping the, the level of the aggregate prices on a steady growth path, say 2% a year. In a way that you could implement this that's been suggested would be to target an average inflation rate over the medium term. Now this framework is quite different from inflation targeting because it depends on history. That means that when you miss the target, it's not treated as a bygone like in the current regime. So just to give an example, if inflation were to undershoot 2%, then the central bank would be committed to making up for it with higher inflation in later years. Obviously, the opposite would be true with overshoots. Now, the bank st also studied various versions of price level targeting extensively leading up to the renewal in 2011. This type of history-dependent framework could, in theory, according to the models, make monetary policy more effective. And it, it could do this by reducing the frequencies of encounters with the lower bound for interest rates. And if you were there, it would make it easier, potentially, to get back up for them. And moreover, since lower and middle income households hold more long-term debt, like mortgages, this type of framework could benefit them most because it would provide greater certainty about the real value of their future debt payments. Now, of course, we know that these benefits could only be realized in practice if the regime were understood and if it were credible. In practice, people may not fully grasp how price level targeting actually works. And promising to make up for past errors is a little bit like saying the, the check's in the mail. And so it would take some time to, tr to, to gain some trust in this commitment. Our research studied just how people would respond in a real life setting. We did a laboratory experiment here in Montreal just to see would they, would they be able to understand this kind of framework. And it turned out at the time that the participants found this idea pretty complicated to understand. They could only understand it partially. And so where does that leave us? Well, I think that despite our, early, or our earlier assessments, a question that we should pursue further is whether the current low neutral rate environment changes the calculus on price level targeting or average inflation targeting. Now, there are other frameworks that are also like buying a new house, but in the next town over. So these include extending the bank's objectives beyond stabilizing only prices to add, say, employment or nominal income. Now, variants of these options were considered thoroughly in the 1980s before we finally settled on inflation targeting in 1991. 
Well, the bank thought at the time that inflation targeting alone could achieve pretty similar results to targeting the stability of both prices and output. It was kind of like getting two for one. And we now know that in the literature is the divine coincidence. And the bank also judged that the added complexity was not worth the, worth the risk that comes with getting into territory that might be better left to elected officials. As it turns out, central banks like the Bank of Canada that operate under a flexible targeting regime already consider a range of labor market indicators and other economic activity measures when setting policy. And these contain valuable information about the future path of inflation that have been keeping with the divine coincidence. And when trade-offs appear between stabilizing inflation and real activity, we consider both, although we have one objective that is, is uh, our primary objective. So in this way, we already have something in common with central banks that have a dual mandate, like the US Federal Reserve and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. That said, there are some differences. Canada's framework is less definitive about the importance of employment and labor market conditions in determining the, op the appropriate path for interest rates. And this can matter because monetary policy can have different distributional consequences depending on the weights played, um, that is placed on each of the objectives. In fact, in some of the new models out there that, that have uh, heterogeneity, you can see that redistribution is a channel through which monetary policy can actually play a stabilizing role. And those who gain the most from expansionary monetary policy are more likely to spend a greater share of their disposable income on consumption. So we need to update our analysis of the trade-offs here. Given the structural changes in the Canadian economy over the past few decades, and ask ourselves, does the divine coincidence still hold as well as it did in the past? It might, and it might not. And could monetary policy under a dual mandate be as effective as fiscal policies, like taxes and transfers at achieving full employment? Now, an alternative to a dual mandate would be to target the growth rate or the level of nominal GDP. And it's technically very different, but I see it as being in the same neighborhood as a dual mandate because it puts more weight on other aspects of the economy that matter for welfare. Nominal GDP targeting has received renewed attention recently because it could reduce the chances of running out of conventional firepower much in the same way as price level targeting does. It also allows for more flexibility to deal with situations where there's a trade-off between price and output stabilization. A good example of when that might occur is when oil prices are rising in an economy that's a net importer of oil, because this pushes inflation up while also weakening the economy. Still, adopting a nominal GDP target shares some of the same drawbacks I mentioned earlier with respect to the frameworks like price level targeting and a dual mandate. There are other practical issues as well, since GDP, many of you know this in the room, is revised quite a lot. And so it's like targeting a moving, a moving object. So more research here is needed here. And the bottom line is that there are several intriguing frameworks that merit further exploration, although none appears to be perfect. This is why I want to see a side-by-side -side assessment of them based on the considerations I outlined earlier. It will be impossible to do a purely quantitative assessment, so a heavy dose of qualitative work and, and judgment will be required, but I think this is okay because we will have a good basis to challenge the status quo. So let me turn now to my second question, which is how the Bank of Canada's toolkit, along with other public policies, can support whatever monetary policy framework we end up choosing. It's critical since, the options materially, since none of the options materially changes the need for an unconventional policy toolkit. Now the bank has a full range of unconventional policy tools that include explicit forward guidance about interest rates, negative nominal interest rates, quantitative easing, other types of asset purchases. And during the crisis, the bank successfully used a conventional commitment to guide market expectations about future interest rates. Some of you will remember that we pledged in April 2009 to leave the policy rate unchanged for a year, depending on the outlook for inflation. 
The bank has never had to use negative nominal interest rates or quantitative easing or other balance sheet type measures, although these have been implemented in other countries. The unconventional tools that were used in the United States or in Europe in the wake of the crisis prevented a bad situation from becoming even worse. That said, whether these are effective at achieving inflation objectives is still an area of debate. And it's also too early to tell whether they have important negative spillovers, particularly if they're used for a long time. Because of this, improving the clarity about our toolkit as part of the inflation control agreement is a necessary step forward. Having a credible contingency plan in place makes it easier to achieve the inflation target even in normal times. There are several lines of inquiry, and I'll just mention one because it's been suggested most recently by the former federal chair of, of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke. And you know, what he suggested is, OK, we'll stick to inflation targeting in normal times, but switch to a price level target when conventional policy is constrained by the lower bound. The idea here is that if you make it clear that in, in extraordinary circumstances that the central bank is aiming for higher inflation, that's going to help push up prices through a shift up in inflation expectations. It's another idea for the list, but undoubtedly it's an imperfect as well. If you look at Japan's experience in trying to boost inflation expectations, it does raise questions about how successful this type of strategy would be, particularly in a low inflation environment. So at this, this whole conversation prompts a more delicate question about how much heavy lifting monetary policy should actually do. Most countries have some automatic fiscal stabilizers in place, like unemployment insurance or progressive, a progressive income tax schedule, which help during a slowdown. Preliminary work at the bank suggests that compared with a situation where monetary policy is the only game in town, the stabilization properties of the Canadian fiscal system do help reduce, on average, the chances of the policy rate being below zero. Now, several participants at our recent conference that I talked about on the inflation targeting framework raised the question of, well, what's the best combination of monetary policy and fiscal policies that's best suited to address extraordinary circumstances, especially when monetary policy risks running out of conventional firepower. I think at the same time, what was also mentioned is that the context for this really matters. The fiscal policy needs to be on a sustainable track for monetary policy to achieve price stability. These are really important issues for further study, but that part's outside the mandate of a central bank. So, so uh, I think the last thing I'd talk about in terms of accompanying policies are macro prudential policies, because there's an emerging consensus that effective macro prudential policies also give monetary policy more room to maneuver. Just take an example that might speak to people today. During a period in which policy interest rates are low for a long time, tightening mortgage financing rules or eligibility criteria can lead, lean against a buildup in financial vulnerabilities, such as elevated household debt. Well, this allows more room for monetary policy to focus on bringing inflation to target. Now, there's still much to learn about the effects of different macroprudential measures and their interaction with monetary policy. And as we learn more, we can take a page from the inflation targeting book. This means working with our partners to further strengthen the macroprudential policy framework by being clearer about objectives, tools, and governance. Doing so would, would enhance the predictability and the efficiency of both macroprudential policies and monetary policies. So let me conclude with a few words on the direction that our work will take leading up to the next agreement for Canada's monetary policy framework in 2021. Notre régime de ciblage d'inflation a sans doute favorisé le bien-être économique et financier des Canadiens. Les dix années d'expérience accumulées depuis la crise nous ont toutefois enseigné qu'il n'est pas parfait. Il est temps d'examiner les autres options. 
So there's no doubt that inflation targeting in our framework has promoted the economic and financial well-being of Canadians. A decade of experience in the post-crisis world, though, has showed us that it's not perfect. It's, con it's time to conduct a thorough review of the alternatives. The bank will develop a comprehensive side-by-side -side assessment of the most promising frameworks to see if any are better. In its work, the bank will engage with academics and other central banks, as well as a wide range of public sector stakeholders and interested Canadians. We need to keep it simple. Focus on clear objectives that monetary policy can actually achieve and assess how it affects people. This is more ambitious than it sounds. We'll need to improve our methods to account for considerations such as distributional effects and, and financial stability. We also must, sure, must ensure that we have the right supporting policy tools and measures that are available in extraordinary circumstances. As we work to strengthen our monetary policy framework, we're, we are counting on people keenly interested in public policy, hopefully some of you in this room, to help us with our work. Merci. Thank you very much. Um, my job now is to um, moderate the question period. So while you're thinking about the questions that you may ask, um, let me just say that when you heard the terms forward guidance and divine coincidence, if you thought that religion was getting a little too far in the central <laughs> bank, I think I can assure you that this is not true. So you can ask questions about that. Uh, but there's lots to choose from. The options before the Bank of Canada, how the bank can support whatever framework is chosen, how much heavy lifting monetary policy uh, could or should do, how it relates to macroprudential policies, uh, and, and other things perhaps that I didn't write down. So please, um, we're going to have a microphone here. Nick has got a microphone in this corner. If you can simply put up your hand. Uh, Nick is going to try to maintain control of the microphone. Uh, so just ask your question, please. And uh, Carolyn Wilkins will be very happy to provide an answer. And I will just sit here and be polite. Be polite. <laughs> I'll try. I will try. Stephen Scott. Okay. Um, my query is prompted by comments made in the New York Times by Paul Volcker um, on October 23rd in connection with his new book. And he says, uh, and he quotes from his book, a 2% target or limit was not in my textbook years ago. I know of no theoretical justification. Now, it is, of course, true that Ben Bernanke went into great detail on this in a speech in Boston in 2010. Um, but what I am prompted to look at, I looked at exactly what is said on the Bank of Canada website, and it says the target aims to keep total CPI inflation at the 2% midpoint of a target range of 1% to 3% over the medium term, the bank raises or lowers its policy interest rate as appropriate in order to achieve the target. Now, my recollection is that years ago, um, the so-called target was simply what would be tolerated where it was necessary to relax monetary policy to deal with uh, a slow economy or recessionary conditions. But now, in common with other central banks, it seems to be a pre-programmed determination to reduce the purchasing power of the currency at a prefixed amount here, 2% approximately, year by year forever. Now, of course, this has all kinds of implications. It's now almost impossible, usually, to um, uh, realize any real return after tax and inflation. And we can go into the way tax treats 
uh, the coupon, even, even the premium from Treasury to inflation protected securities. That too is treated as income and not return of capital. So why not be candid and say that the Bank of Canada is trying to stimulate economy by stimulating spending and reducing the purchasing power of the currency at uh, a certain fixed rate, uh, not to get out of control, but uh, a, a per, on a permanent basis, and um, um, uh, that the, uh, currency stability, purchasing power stability is not the objective at all. It is to keep the economy ticking along as the bank thinks it should be. I can see that you like monetary policy as much as I do. <laughs> it's fabulous. So, and so uh, there's a lot of parts to that question. And so I would say, just as a, as a start off, what, what we are very clear about is that our goal is to have low, stable, and predictable inflation, not zero inflation. And, and you're, you, know, you started off with Volcker and like 2% didn't come from God or from a theoretical model. And that's absolutely right. And that's absolutely right. And I think every central bank has been very clear about that. In fact, some theoretical models will give you an, a negative inflation rate as the optimal one. So, um, and so the obvious question is where the heck did two come from? And why not one or why not zero? Or why not three or why not four? And, and uh, you'll see on our website quite a lot of work on all of that. But I'll try to say exactly kind of where our thinking evolved. I think, you know, in part, uh, we were worried about, about uh, creating, having enough grease in the wheels that might be required to keep the labor market functioning very well. And you say, how could inflation do that? Um, and how it can do that is, is it how, whether it should do that is really a function of whether you believe that, that wages, in a nominal sense, are rigid downward. That just means people don't like to get cuts in their wages in, real, in, real, in, in uh, nominal terms. They don't mind if it gets inflated away a bit, but they're really going to resist that. And that could end up with higher structural employment than you would have otherwise. Um, you know, the jury's out about how important those, are, those effects are. Uh, but that was one reason, uh, particularly at the time, plus some just measurement errors that seem to be big. I think more recently, uh, the worry about how important downward nominal wage rigidity is, is we looked at that again uh, more recently in 2016. It didn't seem to be the biggest worry nor were measurement errors. What really uh, made us hesitate from, from thinking again about reducing the inflation target, say, to 1%, because we've studied that too, uh, is, is really because of what that would mean for the probability of hitting the effective lower bound on interest rates, running out of firepower. And that kind of brings me to my, the next part of your question was, is, well, you know, if you're doing this, and in fact, you're, you're making us all uh, sort of in real terms, in real terms, poor. And, and I, I guess I said in my speech that I thought money was neutral in the long run. So that's a conversation. I think what monetary policy can do can affect cyclical things, but it's not going to affect, it's not going to affect the structure of the economy. And the fact that returns are so low today, um, when you think about 10-year yields or, or the yields, it's because of where the neutral interest rates or the equilibrium interest rates are uh, globally, not just in Canada. They're about two percentage for Canada, two percentage points lower than they were uh, at the beginning of the 2000s. And that's entirely due to structural reasons, not, not reasons related to policy, at least for the most part. And the structural reasons are, are mainly because there's a slowing in the population, and that's bringing the growth rate, the potential growth rate of all economies down. And so if you want to fix the, the returns uh, the rate of return issue, you really have to deal with the structural issues, like competitiveness and other things. While we're waiting for the second question, let me just say that while we have been developing the curriculum in the Max Bell School, I have not been teaching my regular macro classes. And I am delighted, and I have been missing that. And I'm delighted to therefore hear a lunchtime discussion that talks about long-run money neutrality <laughs> and downward nominal wage rigidity, because they're fabulous topics. So thank you for asking that question, Stephen Scott. We need some more questions. Bill Watson. I don't know if you can answer this question, but uh, I remember a couple of monetary policy regime changes, uh, the switch to monetarism in the 1970s. Oh boy. Uh, I actually barely remember that. I was about four years old. 
Uh, but I had an early interest in monetary policy. Uh, and then, of course, the 1989-1990 uh, uh, switchover. Uh, I think both of those came out of what were really perceived to be crises. Right. That policy just wasn't working anymore at all. And I, you know, I don't want to pray. You're supposed to praise a guest a little bit, but I don't sense that there's a, uh, a widespread belief in Canada that we're in crisis in terms of monetary policy. And I don't want to foreclose the discussion and debate that you've invited for the next two years, but I wonder without a sense of urgency of that sort, whether we're going to really decide that we have to throw out the system we know and try something. You know, it, it, I watch those home shows that you go in and you see what the house looks like and it's by the beach, but it doesn't have, you know, the big playroom and so on. You know, it's very tempting to just stick with what you got. So, so, so uh, well, I also don't really remember the 70s, although I might have been a little bit older in the 70s than you. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but the thing is, uh, and not that interested in monetary policy, is full disclosure, when I was that age. Uh, but, uh, but... Oh, I think uh, there's a story there. But I do remember... I do remember uh, that, that uh, you know, the fact that money growth targeting didn't work broke a lot of people's hearts because it was just so elegant. And uh, it really was. It's, it's a pretty simple thing. And in fact, countries use it now, like Argentina, when they need to get the, the train back on the tracks. Because it's, especially when you're thinking about base money, you can, something that maybe you can achieve. Um, but of course, we all know that the relationship isn't stable. And there's a funny story here that when I joined the bank, we were still trying to find a stable relationship between, Good luck. between the money aggregates and growth and inflation. And I think they do this to all new people. I was put on the, <laughs> so, so, okay. So if, if you go to, to, to targeting, you know, I think I spent a lot of time in real estate in the speech saying just how well this has served us. I think the two issues that I raised running out of firepower, and, and uh, thinking about how do you manage that buildup of, of uh, financial vulnerabilities in the case of low for long, which we'll have even, even back at neutral is still pretty low, isn't it, relative to, to uh, say, the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. And so, and so uh, there's a lot of work to be done to think about how to manage those, those risks and within the framework as it is. Why, why do you want to look at a horse race of all the other ones? I think that after 25 years and after 10 years after a crisis, we've got a lot done already. You do a side-by-side -side analysis, a horse race, as I like to call it, based on clear criteria, and we'll all know, if we end up with the same framework, why and on what basis. And I think from an accountability point of view, that's very important. If it turns out that we find out something that we didn't know, we, we need to be, we need to have a bit of humility. We don't know everything. Then we should take it on board. Can I have a follow-up on that? So every five years, this uh, agreement between the bank and the government takes place and has been renewed however many times, five years. Isn't that examination usually done every five years? Or is it just, or are you suggesting a more thorough so what we normally do, so what we normally do is we take one alternative at a time. So we've taken a lower inflation target, we've taken a higher one, we've taken PLT, price level targeting, and we did, uh, yeah, but we haven't done a full assessment of a dual mandate. And nominal GDP targeting, we haven't done since the 1980s. And so we kind of do one at a time, and we have our criteria. But I think being very transparent about what those are in doing a side-by-side -side assessment will really set a really good foundation for what we end up deciding, but also the next renewals. Maybe the next renewals can be lighter because unless something really changes, uh, then, uh, then uh, we don't need to maybe do all these investigations as, as deeply as we do today. Okay, other questions? So much more to talk about, folks. The role of fiscal yeah, policy. No, yeah, no, no. Sir, here comes the microphone. Thank you. 
what would you say to the idea that uh, <clears throat> the, the dual mandate actually uh, could give monetary policy, I would say, a more human face and bring greater acceptance with the masses? Because, you know, talking about uh, low and stable inflation doesn't really strike a very... Uh, convincing chord, I would say, with the average people, while talking about doing this in the context of maximizing employment or, you know, GDP, uh, nominal GDP, uh, has, you know, an immediate benefit uh, image attached to it uh, for people. So uh, I would say that uh, the dual mandate uh, um, certainly uh, adds something in terms of acceptability uh, to, uh, to policy and is rarely, in fact, incompatible with the single mandate of pursuing price stability. So, so uh, I, I think it's, being, it's become clear to many central banks that having a more human face is very important, being more accessible in terms of how we talk about our business and what we're doing, there's no doubt in my mind that that was always important and it feels like it's even more important than it is today. Um, it's true that people relate more to their own incomes and their own jobs and how it affects them in their real life than they do inflation because although they do see inflation as well, usually at the grocery store and at the pump, so I think people get what inflation means to them. Uh, I think there's a couple of ways to, to do that. You, don't have to take on a dual mandate necessarily uh, to achieve that if, you, if you're more clear about how you take those factors into account in achieving your inflation target, which is part of what I was talking about. We're not, uh, we're not particularly uh, formal about how we do that. Um, so there are trade-offs. Uh, you can see in other countries that focus on full employment, there's a lot of discussion of what do you mean by full employment and are you telling me that once we get there, it's as good as it gets. It, it feels, again, very personal, thinking about uh, telling people what a natural rate of unemployment is. When it changes over time, it's not something that you can observe. Uh, inflation is something that we don't measure, and, and, uh, and, and everybody can see it. So there are pros and cons with, with that argument, uh, but certainly the idea of being more uh, relatable uh, and people seeing what we're doing. In fact, that is our mandate, the financial and economic welfare of Canada. And so uh, anything we can do to make that clear about why what we're doing achieves that would be, or what we're doing achieves that would be, would be desirable. I wonder if the statement that low and stable inflation may not resonate with people is, is a sign of the times. So we have had inflation <laughs> in this country below 3% since 1992. Uh, it has been almost exactly, as you said in your speech, an average of 2% within a tenth of a percentage point for 25 years. So um, maybe it's the case that people that are younger than people of a certain age um, don't resonate with inflation because it hasn't been part of their life. So I guess my question is, yeah. is it harder to explain the benefits of low inflation today than it was 25 years ago, because uh, the audience is different? I, I think so. I think, you know, Mr. Watson over there had it right, hit the nail on the head. When, when, when you're in the, the, the 70s and the 80s and you see inflation and that's a drag and slay, then everybody doesn't like it, but they're behind you when, when you raise interest rates to achieve it. But once you're there, um, it kind of looks like a really silly thing to pursue because everybody, you, if you do your job well, People think, well, why are you raising interest rates? There's no inflation. And that's because you do your job well. And so this counterfactual about what might happen if we didn't raise interest rates, that we would have to just do even more later, it's hard for people to see this absence of a bad outcome. And so you're, you're kind of the victim of your own success in terms of explaining to people how well, how well it works. And of course, uh, I'd rather be the victim of our own success than being in a position of having to explain it. So we'll have to find other means to explain it. We have Jean-Marie. 
Jean-Marie Dufour. Okay, to get more modern, precisely, there's been, been a lot of talk recently about new currencies, cryptocurrencies, yeah. digital money. Uh, I guess in your thinking about uh, monetary policy for the future, I mean, I mean, uh, what, what, what is the, uh, are, are you worried about it? Are you uh, thinking about it? Uh, what or what are, do you have a priori uh, uh, views that we should care or should not care? Mm-hmm. And I guess that's my question. Well, the bank is looking at crypto assets and cryptocurrencies in particular quite closely. Uh, with respect to this particular renewal of the inflation target framework, we don't think that, that it's a big issue. We don't see cryptocurrencies, so currencies that are not denominated in a national currency, taking hold here or, or in other advanced economies. And I think the reason is because we do a good job establishing the, the purchasing power of our own currency. Uh, aside from other risks. And so, but at the same time, it's incumbent on a central bank to think about, particularly when we have less use of cash, whether or not uh, there is a public policy role or a public role for some kind of medium of exchange and store of value that's provided by the public, by the central bank, since that's that's really our job. Uh, And so we're looking at that as a research project Uh, You know the literature as well as I do. There's some people out there saying, oh, well, if you got rid of cash and you had a central bank digital currency, you would remove the effective lower bound or the the zero lower bound on interest rates. I think that's not a a really good reason to pursue a central bank digital currency. I think the best reason to pursue it or think about whether it's a good idea is to think, does it back to public policy? Is it a public good? And for what reason is it a public good? And what would we lose if we didn't have a safe store of value that was provided by the central bank? I'm going to give the last question to Antonio Maoni. Thank you. So this is a little more personal question, actually. I wanted to ask you two things. The first is, as senior deputy bank of uh, governor of the Bank of Canada, what is it that keeps you late at the office? So in other words, or up at night, what is the one thing uh, that is most top of the mind today? I don't think it's cryptocurrency. I don't know. You get a really good answer to the cryptocurrency. What's that? And the second question I have is, what would you say to some of the uh, la relève, the next generation of people who will be filling this room, um, some of whom are seated with us, uh, about what they should be looking for in terms of the most important tools of today and the most important challenge they will face in the future? Ah, those are good questions. So, so I think what keeps me late at the office and what keeps me up at night are two different things. Uh, so what keeps me up at night are things that worry me. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, and obviously in, uh, in, uh, the Canadian world, uh, as we've said, we're we're quite uh, we're quite uh, you know, we'll be happier when we see the vulnerabilities in the household sector uh, continue to to, uh, to ease gradually. Uh, I think the trade tensions that are there um, between largely between the U.S. and China are a real concern, uh, not because so much of what's happening today, but what that might mean for productivity in the future. What might that mean for Canada as a small open economy and all the value chains that have been built up? It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not uh, a good outcome because Canada has profited, benefited so much from, from uh, globalization. And I think the rest of the world has too. I still think that's a two-sided risk. It could be resolved. Uh, but those would be two things. What keeps me at, at, at the office uh, late is, is actually things like what I just talked about today. There is so much work that's going on at the bank. Our research work plan is, is uh, fascinating. There's a lot of really geeky questions that need to be explored. And, uh, and we've got excellent researchers to work with. And so, uh, and so uh, maybe that's what gets me in the morning. That's what maybe keeps me a bit late at night. Uh, it's fabulous. And, and I would say to the students, um, I started my career with a certain uh, set of knowledge that came from the universities that I went to, and that was a, an, a very solid base. Uh, but if I compared what I knew then to what I have had to learn or I've chosen to learn uh, over the years, it's, it's quite different. 
And this idea that you're going to have a career where you, you take what you learn, it's your little toolkit, and you, and you take it everywhere, I think it doesn't work. It didn't even, I'm pretty old, and it didn't work then. It works even less now because things are changing so quickly. And so, you know, embracing uh, cryptocurrencies or embracing the digital economy or a lot of the subjects that, that I've had to over the counter derivatives are all things that I think if you have the attitude that learning is great. Lifelong learning is, is exciting, keeps you at the office, but for the right reason, uh, then you're going you're gonna to love getting up every morning and going to work. Thank you.